Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on uh, BC110, our identity in Christ. I see a question on the chat. Uh, Lakshmi has asked, uh, when a believer sins, does it affect the growth of the spirit? Right? And the answer is yes. Uh, like, let me explain this. So, uh, just because I do something wrong, it doesn't mean everything changes. No, because immediately, you know, the Holy Spirit will let me know I've done something wrong. I realize I've done something wrong. And I ask the Lord to forgive me, to cleanse me, and we continue on. So, just because I made did that sin, you know, doesn't mean everything is gone or uh, my spiritual growth has suddenly dropped from you know one level to ten levels down. That doesn't happen. It's not like that. But if a believer continues in sin, right? So if a person continues living in that sin, then definitely. Uh, it's going to affect their growth. Basically, it's going to affect their relationship with God. right? So that's why we have to be careful. Um, there's some scriptures on this. First uh, John chapter 3. Uh, John makes it very clear in First John chapter 3. Let me give you the exact verse, maybe like verse 6, I think it is. Um, yeah. Uh, first John verse chapter three verse six. First John chapter three verse six. The first part of that. Um, uh, uh, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Right? Now notice what he says. And then verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So what is John saying? What John is saying is that as believers, we don't continue practicing sin. It's not like we may never commit sin, because if you look at chapter 1, he says, you know, if we say that we have no sin, then we are deceiving ourselves, but we must confess our sins. In chapter 2, again to the believers, in verse 12, he says, you know, our sins are forgiven us for his name's sake. So being consistent with chapter 1, chapter 2, we can interpret what he writes here in chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, as those who are born of God, they don't practice sin. Because he uses that word, practice. Right? Um, uh, verse 7, right? practicing righteousness, practicing unrighteousness. That means they're continuing in it. So as believers, we don't practice. That is not our way of life. We don't live in sin. But instead, we practice righteousness, right? And uh, it keeps us going. And this is then connected to our relationship with God. You know, in the same chapter, First John three, if you go to verse twenty-two, I think it is, yeah, um, yeah, verse 21, 21, 22. Beloved, if a heart does not condemn us, or let me read verse twenty. For if a heart condemns us, God is greater than a heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So He says, you know, our heart. So when, when, when a person, believer, sins, his heart is going to tell him, you did something wrong. And God knows. That's what He's saying, verse 20. But if our heart doesn't condemn us, then, oh, we can be really free with God. You know, we have confidence with God. Our relationship with God is really free, and uh, and our prayers also can be answered. So it's all connected, right? Not practicing sin gives us that freedom in the presence of God, and so on, right? And then in chapter four, verse seventeen, he tells us how we live as Jesus lives. Okay, 
I hope I answered your question. There's, there's a lot, lot of things there. Any other questions? OK. Let us start, please, the next section. Let us share this. All right, section three, justified, made righteous in Christ. So the first thing we're going to focus on, now we're going to focus on different aspects. The first thing we're going to focus on, and this should be something that all of us, all of us, we just know it in our hearts, is that in Christ we have been made, we have been justified. To be justified, simply means we have been made righteous. Okay, Justified means we have been made righteous. Okay? A nice way of explaining this in the old times, they used to say, to be justified means we have been made just as if I never sinned. To be made just as if I never sinned. So imagine how you would be if you were made just as if you never sinned. But that's exactly what God has done for you and me in Christ. We have been made just as if I never sinned. So when we go before God, we don't go before God as though we are dirty, filthy sinners. We go before God just as if I never sinned. Because He justified. It is God who has justified us. We will look at all these scriptures. I'm just giving a little overview. God has justified us. He said, I have made you just as if you never sinned. Why? Because Jesus finished the work on the cross. He took our sins. He shed His blood. The blood of Jesus Christ washed us and made us just as if we never justified. You're made righteous. So when we go before God, we go as though we have, as, we, as justified people, people who have been made just as if we never sinned. That means there is no condemnation. There is no sense of guilt and shame. Of course, we have reverence for God. But we don't try to, God, I'm coming from behind you. Here's on prayer request, run away. <laughs> it's not like that. We come, there is freedom, there's joy in our relationship with God. Similarly, when we are dealing with the devil, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. So one, the devil's one big tactic is accuse. Accusations, that's his name. He's the accuser. Of the brethren, accusing, accuser. Ah, see, you're bad, you're useless. You said this, you told a lie, you did like this. Accuse, 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 condemn. That is his main tactic. Accusations, condemnation. That's his job. Example, you're about to, somebody says, please come and pray. You're about to pray, and thought comes. You didn't pray at home. Why, how are you going to pray now? That's the way devil works. Accuse. He's making you feel guilty. He's making you feel condemned. Accusation. That is the devil's job. I understand. But, when we face the devil, we must know God has justified us. If God justified me, the devil has no business accusing me, condemning me. Right? God himself, God is the greatest judge. Who is the devil? God has justified you. Why should you listen to the 
accusation or condemnation of the devil. Are you understanding? Right? Question. Yes. So, okay, so the question is, uh, the devil makes us feel guilty, but feeling guilty is a good thing uh, because then we can repent. Okay, so here's the thing. We have to differentiate between condemnation and conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Word of God convicts us. The Word of God is given for conviction. 2 Timothy 3.16, right? So there are two things that God uses to convict the believer. One is the Word of God, and second is the Holy Spirit. Conviction always leads us to repentance. Condemnation is a different thing. Condemnation is you are useless, you're good for nothing, you cannot do this, God is angry with you. Condemnation is from the devil. And condemnation cripples us. It makes us useless. Right? So we have to differentiate the two. If the when the Holy Spirit convicts us, or when we are convicted by the word of God, you're reading the Bible and you say, Oh, I didn't I have not done that. I, I did against that. That's conviction. So when we then we repent, we say, God, I'm sorry. So conviction is a good thing. It leads us to repentance. But condemnation cripples us. It leads us to inaction. We can't do anything. So these are two separate things. Okay? So we must be open to correction that comes from the Holy Spirit, comes to the Word of God. Sometimes other people will, godly people will correct us. Sometimes our own conscience will correct us. These are good things. We must be open to that. Correction that brings conviction. But the condemnation from the devil is a bad thing. It puts us down. So that's the difference. That guilt, so the, the, let me say like this, the, the feeling of guilt is a good thing. But we must understand that that sense of guilt, if it comes from conviction, that's a good thing. If it comes from condemnation, it's a bad thing. But the recognition of wrong, the recognition that I've done something wrong, which then, you know, obviously it, it gives that feeling of guilt or recognition of sin, which leads me to repent. That's a good thing. But it should come from the right way, from the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have to repent, turn away from it. But we don't live under guilt. We don't live under that. Okay, so we must be very strong in this understanding that we are the righteousness of God. Otherwise, that's a point where the devil can hit the believer and make believers feel guilty, unworthy, unfit, and then believers stop serving God, they stop doing things. So let's look at it. Lesson number 22. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Again, so this is a verse that I would request you to memorize. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him, that is, He chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, so even before He created everything, He had this plan that we would be in Christ. And being in Christ, what would, how would we be? We should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So we are in Christ and we are holy and without blame in Him. Holy and without blame before Him in love. 
So in the eyes of God, you are holy and you are without blame. Because you're covered by His love. So, how does God see you? Holy and without blame. So you must keep that in your mind. Before Him, before Him, before God, or in the eyes of God, I am holy and without blame. In Christ. In Christ. So let's say this together. In Christ, I am holy and without blame in God's eyes. Let's say it again. In Christ, I am holy and without blame in God's eyes. You know? So when the devil puts the thought, hey, you're so... God is, God is judging you. Fire will come down on you. Something like that. God will judge you today. They're going to be punished by God today. No. Devil, go read Ephesians 1 4. It says, He chose me in Him before the foundation of the world, that I should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Go read. It is written. That's how Jesus, you know, resisted the devil. He said, It is written. So he said, Devil, it is written that I am holy. And without blame before him in love in Christ amen so this is what God has done for us we are holy and without blame and and Paul repeats this in the other epistles as well in Colossians 1 verses 20 to 22 and by him that is through Christ by him to reconcile all things to himself by him whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who are once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Oh, so beautiful. Look at verse 22. So what did Jesus do through his death? Do you believe in Jesus dying on the cross? You believe in Jesus died, he died for you? Yeah. What did he do for you? It says, verse 22, in the body of his flesh, through death, that means through his suffering in his body. What did he do? He presented you holy, blameless, above reproach. In the eyes of God. See that? So don't make the death of Jesus Christ go waste. Above reproach, no. Uh, uh, to reproach means like I will, I reproach you. That means I scold you, I correct you, I blame you. Above that, that means there's no reproach, no judgment, no condemnation. Holy, no blame. No condemnation, above reproach, above judgment, in the eyes of God. Right. So through his death, through what he did on the cross, this is what Jesus gave you and me. He said, through my suffering, this is what I'll do for you. I will present you holy, blameless. No reproach, no condemnation, no judgment in the eyes of God. So don't make his suffering on the cross go waste. He finished the work. He said, I did it, finished. That means this verse is true. Now we have to accept it. So you and I can say, through his death, I have been made holy blameless, above reproach, in the eyes of God. The devil cannot challenge that. Because we're not saying, because I did good works, I am holy. No, no, no. I'm saying, because of the cross. Because of Jesus' death. That's all that. That is the basis. The devil cannot challenge that. 
But because of his death, I get to stand, you get to stand in the eyes of God, before God, holy, without any blame, without any condemnation, a judgment, condemn, without it. You can stand peacefully in the eyes of God. Amen? This is what Jesus did. So we must accept it. And whenever you go to pray, whenever you go to worship, whenever you, anytime you are re even reading the Bible, don't let guilt, shame, condemnation come on you. Now, be free. Why? Because Jesus did it on the cross. Through his death, he did this for me. I'm just accepting it. And I'm walking in it. So in the morning or any time, condemnation comes, don't reject. Uh, don't accept, reject. Reject. Because you are holy, blameless, and above reproach in the eyes of God. Lesson number 23. Ephesians 1.6. Lesson number 23, except in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the beloved. In the beloved means in Christ. The beloved is Jesus Christ. So in the beloved, in Christ, He has made us. God Himself has done it. What has he done? It. He has made us accepted. So you are accepted. You are welcomed. You're not rejected. God has rejected me. God said, I'm useless. God said, I have nothing to do with you. Bye bye, Tata. No. no. You are accepted in the beloved. You're welcomed. If you look at some other versions, it says, uh, He has. Granted special honor, highly favored, covered by grace. He has made us objects of his grace. You know. So in Jesus Christ, we are accepted. We are not hated. We are not accused. We are not shamed. We are not condemned. But we are loved, accepted, honored, and favored. Loved, accepted, honored, favored. So let's say this together. In Christ, I am loved, honored, accepted, favored by God. See, in Christ. He's done this for us. Okay? So we have to change our thinking. So it's like that same old, you know, when you go back to that same example, about that orphan boy in the slum, he's accept he's brought into the family. The the parents have fully accepted him. They don't treat him like something. No, they fully accept. But he also needs to accept that. Yeah, I am accepted in this family. I belong to this family. I am loved. I'm cared for. I am favored. I am blessed in this family. You shouldn't think that, ah, oh, they think I'm a slum boy. No, no. That was old. Old things have gone. All things have become new. You are accepted in this family. They have adopted you. You fully belong to this family. So that's how, as believers, you must say, okay, God, thank you. Thank you. You did it for me. I accept it. We could never have paid for it. We never could never have earned it. We could have never worked for this. But God did it through the cross. He just accepted. Right? And then we walk in this. Right? And really, you know, the sense of being accepted by God is so important. Because many times, you know, when you think of people who, you know, especially when you think of people who are suicidal, um, uh, they want to end their life. They have find no meaning. A lot of it comes from a sense of rejection. That means nobody in this world loves me. 
nobody cares for me I, nobody's there for me and so they want to end their own life you know but when we embrace this truth you and i come to a place where even if no human being loves me hey my god in heaven he has accepted me in christ that gives every that just completes it all of course we it's nice to be loved and cared for by other people and i, I understand that we need that it's it's good it's good but i'm saying that this truth is so powerful that when we come to a recognition that god has accepted us favored us loved us honored us nothing else matters so he has made us to be accepted in the beloved in christ Lesson 24, we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, please. Page 35. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That means these kinds of people, they won't get into God's kingdom. Verse 11. And such were some of you. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And he's recognizing, hey, some of you were like these terrible, living these terrible lives. Such were some of you. Verse 11. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So think about this is what has happened to you and me. Before coming to Christ, we could have been living terrible lives, whatever it is, terrible lives before coming to Christ. But now, in Christ, what has happened? We are washed. Washed means all the dirt has gone. It's gone. You're not dirty. You're not filthy. The dirt has gone. The sin has gone. You're washed. Sanctified. Sanctified means you're set apart as holy. So we'll be talking about this in the next lesson. But sanctified. God has set you apart. God has made you holy. So you're washed. That means you. all the dirt is gone. Sin is gone. Now God himself has made you holy, sanctified. You are holy and justified. Justified means just as if I never sinned, made righteous. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, what is your current condition? Are you dirty? Dirty, filthy, you are washed. Are you sinful? You are holy, sanctified. Are you condemned? No. You are justified. That is your current condition. But when some people pray, like I said, some, I'll just give an example. Oh God, I am such a dirty, filthy sinner. Why are you praying like that? God said He washed you. So either you believe God and accept what He did. Keep quiet. Don't, don't, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but don't, you know, Jesus has done such an important work for us. He washed us. Don't, you know, reject that. 
He washed you. So you say, God, thank you. I am clean. I've been washed. I'm not a dirty, filthy person. I've been washed. Lord, thank you, you've made me holy. Don't say, God, I'm such a sinner, God. You were like that. But now, you have been washed and you are being made holy. Lord, thank you that you have sanctified me. You have made me holy. Thank you. Don't say, Lord, I know I don't deserve anything, God. Only your judgment, God. You were like that. But now you have been justified. There is no judgment, no condemnation against you. You are accepted in the beloved. We are holy and without blame, above reproach in his sight. So when you pray, Father, thank you that you washed me. Thank you, Lord, that you made me holy. Thank you that I'm accepted in your eyes. Thank you I'm holy and without blame and no condemnation in your eyes. Thank you I can come to you freely and pray and worship as your son, your daughter. Acknowledge what God has done for you. Amen? So think about it even in the natural. Suppose a parent gives a nice gift to their son or daughter. Nice. As some example, let's say they've given them a nice, uh, you know, nice clothes to wear. They're given as a gift. And then this child comes to the parent. I have nothing to wear. I have no clothes. I am so poor. The parent will feel, hey, just yesterday I gave you some nice clothes. What are you talking? What do you say? You have nothing. I just gave you. Now think about it in the spiritual. God, because of what Jesus did on the cross, He has made you holy, blameless, above reproach in His sight. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has accepted you in the beloved. He's washed you, sanctified you, justified you. Now you and I go, oh, Father, I am such a sinner, useless. I paid such a great price. Jesus paid such a great price for you. Now what will the parent like? The parent will like when the child comes and says, Oh, I like this dress. Thank you so much. It's so nice. I really like it. Thank you. That's what the parent wants to hear. So when you go before God and say, Father, thank you that I've been holy. You made me holy. You washed me. You sanctified me. You justified Thank you, Lord. Father is happy. That's how. You understand? That's how we should acknowledge, thank you, thank him for these wonderful things he's done for you and me in Jesus Christ. Thank him. God, thank you. You've given me this robe of righteousness. Thank you. You washed me. Thank you. You made me holy. Thank you. You made me without any blame. I can come freely as a person who's accepted and honored and loved and beloved. I can come. Thank you, Lord. That will make his heart happy. Okay? Let's do one more. Lesson number 25. Lesson number 25. Page 36. The righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Think about this. Look at these scriptures. Romans 3.22. Romans 3.22, page 37. Even the righteousness of God 
through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So Paul is saying the righteousness of God has been given to every person and it is upon every person who believes in Jesus Christ. There is no difference. What's he talking about? The righteousness of God has been given to every person and it has been put upon every person who believes. The righteousness of God. God's own righteousness. So to imagine this, I mean to try to understand it, you can imagine it like this. Imagine God is wearing a white robe. Okay, imagine. Clean white robe. No, nothing. And then he takes that robe, same robe, and he puts it on you. So the same white robe that is on God is on you. Same. He did not take, he didn't call Angel Gabriel, come, I'll take your coat and give it. He didn't call some angel. No, no. What's his own, his righteousness? Righteousness of God. His own righteousness. He has taken it and put it on you. It says, to all and on all who believe. Everyone. So what do you have right now? Right now, you have the righteousness of God on you and in you. It's upon you. God gave it to you. So when you pray or when you worship or in the spiritual realm, anything you do, when you face the devil and you rebuke demons, you say, devil, come out in the name of Jesus. Devil, I command you to leave. What are you wearing? You are clothed with the righteousness of God. It is what is on God is, is on you. So when you come into the presence of God, so you imagine you're coming into the throne room. You're walking into the throne room. God is seated, the God of glory. You can't even see His glory. It's so great. He's seated on that throne and you're coming. What are you wearing? You are wearing what is on Him. His righteousness is on you. That is the only way you and I can ever come into that presence. There's no other way. Nothing else will stand in His presence. So you're coming, you're walking, and His righteousness is on you. And that's the only way we can enter the presence of God. We cannot enter any other way. So, we don't have to have any feeling of, is God going to strike me down dead right now? My shirt is clean or not? Hey, His righteousness is on you. Because He gave it. It says that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus is to all and on all who believe. His righteousness is on you, has been given to you, because you believe in Jesus. So as you walk in the presence of God, into the throne room of God, His righteousness, nothing else. Because there's nothing we have. We walk boldly. Father, thank you that you have made me the righteousness of God. Acknowledge that. Father, thank you that you have made me the righteousness of God. That is how I come to you. So let us say, to say this together. Father, thank you that you have made me the righteousness of God. That is how I come to you. Amen. That is the only way we can go into the presence of God. He gave us his righteousness. So you are wearing that white, spotless, spotless white robe. 
you will you come to pray to worship spotless with the righteousness of God. So some more verses here. First Corinthians one verse thirty. So this is a verse you must memorize. First Corinthians one verse thirty. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus has become all this for us. But you just focus on one part. Christ is my righteousness. Or if you want to put it like this, you have been made righteous like Jesus. Does Jesus have access in the Father's presence? Of course. That same access you have. Because Christ is your righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. Yeah. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. You have become the righteousness of God. So let this truth sink into you. And uh, you apply this when you pray, when you worship. Now, of course, I'll say a few words and we'll close. We'll continue from Lesson 26 next week. God has given us His righteousness. Now, when we sin, we have to recognize and say, I am sorry. Okay? And the Bible says immediately, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So, He takes care of it. Clean. So, our mindset, our should always be, we are the righteousness of God. We are holy, we are without blame, we are accepted in His eyes, and um, His righteousness is on me and given to me. I am the righteousness of God. So I can go before God without any sense of condemnation, guilt. We'll see that next week. No sense. But the moment I sin, the moment I say something or do something wrong, I say, God, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. It's, it's done. Right? And we don't continue in sin. We don't obviously live in sin. That's not what we want to do. Right? So knowing this truth about our righteousness is so important. Any questions before we close? Any questions? Let me just check online. Are there any questions online? See ya. Okay, no questions. All right, so let's pray. Uh, we'll continue from where we stop. Sorry, question here, Vinay, please go ahead. Oh, yes. Okay, for next, thank you for reminding me. Next week, for next week, uh, please memorize these six verses. Second Corinthians 5.17. Ephesians 1, 3 and 4, 3 and 4, so we added 4 today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. And uh, what was the one that I mentioned today? Uh, oh, no, no uh, Colossians 3.16 was, I was just talking about the word of Christ dwelling in you, richly. Um, about the verses for in Christ. So we gave you three. Uh, we will also do, give you first Corinthians one thirty, right? Okay. Let's also do first Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six, nine to eleven. First Corinthians six, nine to eleven. And Romans 3.22, Romans 3.22, and one last one, 
Second Corinthians 5, 21. Second Corinthians 5, 21. Okay. I will go to this list again. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. First Corinthians 1, verse 30. Romans 3, 22. Second Corinthians 5, 21. And also First Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Okay, so you have one week to memorize these six verses. One verse a day, easy you can do. Okay, so next class, I'll just ask randomly. You must be ready. Tuck, tuck, tuck. We'll finish quickly, then we'll get into the lesson. Okay, online students, please, you also, please memorize these six passages for your own good, to build yourself, and uh, to learn all the things we're doing, okay? Uh, thank you. God bless you. Uh, you can go for your break and get ready for the next class. Thank you.